You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about making machine learning work in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Richard Socher is an old friend and the CEO of U.com. And before that, he was the chief scientist of Salesforce. But I first knew him as one of the very first people working at the intersection of deep learning and language models. I always have questions for Richard whenever I see him, and this is no different. But this episode is particularly fun in that I try to hack his website while I'm talking to him. So I hope you enjoy this one as much as I enjoyed doing it. Well, awesome. So, I mean, Richard, we've known each other a long time and um, I've worked with you in many different capacities, but I thought for, for folks who don't know you, maybe you could give us a little overview of your career. Yeah, happy to. I guess uh, the relevant stuff started in 2003 when I started studying linguistic computer science uh, back in Leipzig, Germany. Um, my you know parents thought, okay, it's kind of a niche subject. Uh, like, is that really a big career that you can have from that? But I thought it would be epic to combine math and languages, both you know two things I love, um, and they really get you know married in a computer. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, I did a bunch of studies, did my masters at the Max Planck Institute and the University of Saarbrücken, uh, did an exchange year in uh, um, Montpellier in southern France, um, and. Starting in 2010, I started to actually do useful, like sort of research and and contributing back um, to the field. And I was very fortunate uh, at it to be at Stanford in you know the late uh, 2000s, uh, early 2010, uh, when Andrew Ng uh, discovered uh, deep learning uh, broadly consumed back then. There still like restricted Boltzmann machine types of things, not just feed forward neural nets um, for computer vision. And I was in Prismanic's group uh, doing natural language processing and getting kind of dismayed by all the feature engineering that was happening in the field of NLP. Uh, you know, like every PhD and a lot of these papers would spend like 80% talking about some really nifty conditional random field or, or some support back to machine idea. But then really like 50 to 80% of the work was on engineering the features to feed into these nifty uh, machine learning models. And I'm like, it just doesn't feel right. It's just like on some fundamental intellectual level, it feels very unsatisfying. And so uh, when when Andrew talked about we can learn features in computer vision instead of having SIF features and other stuff, like it'll just, you give it raw pixels, you tell it what you want, and it'll learn stuff in between. I'm like, clearly that that line of thinking is the solution for NLP, even more so than for vision, even though there it's like been very successful. And so at the time, you know, I started doing uh, actually not enough background research. Uh, I reinvented a bunch of stuff from scratch, including recursive neural nets that had existed sort of in some form or another in the 80s, but no one really used them. And they're like on vectors that were like 16-bit wide and binary and like silly stuff like that. And so, um, but I, I basically just started running with that idea and, you know, started building word vectors um, uh, with Jeffrey Pennington and Manning and and then Andrew at some point saw, oh, wow, this is actually pretty cool. Um, and I, I was able to build a single model that mapped both sentences and images into the same vector space. You can then actually describe an image with a full length sentence, which I don't think anyone had ever done before. And so uh, that was a lot of fun. Anyway, long story short, graduated in 2014 uh, from Stanford. Uh, and then I did two things. One, no one was teaching neural nets anywhere in the world. So I started a class uh, and that class eventually after two years merged because at that point, which was like around 2016, like 80% of all the benchmarks were now dominated by a, a, a neural network rather than any other kind of uh, machine learning model. Uh, and so Chris Manning, who was teaching the main official NLP class was like, oh, let's like merge our classes together. Uh, so, so that was fun. And then, but my main job was actually to start MetaMind uh, as a startup that tried to make it very easy to train neural nets for other organizations. Uh, we, in some ways, chewed off too much and were maybe a little early, right? As a mix of like scale.ai, I mean, face, um, a little bit of weights and biases even, because you could just drag and drop some images or text files into the browser. It would show you how it's training and then give you a nice sort of analytics of, you know, your confusion matrix and errors that it made and you can sort by, you know, confidence and incorrectness and, you know, or correctness. And then you'd have three lines of Python code 
to just run that classifier in production. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of great technology built, but that technology was ultimately uh, in even better hands uh, within a larger company that had all these use cases already. And so we got acquired by Salesforce. Um, and I had a phenomenal time there as chief scientist uh, for four years, eventually uh, executive vice president, running a lot of the AI efforts there uh, and having a research team, which I very much enjoyed. Um, and, you know, in that research team, we did a bunch of amazing work, uh, some of which I feel like hasn't had its moment yet. Uh, one actually is called the AI Economist that I love. It's like a two-level RL system to find the most uh, productive and uh, equality generating kind of uh, way to tax and subsidize people in the economy. But anyway, uh, some other work that I think did have, you know, ha does have its moment in the sun right now is that in 2018, we had to prompt engineering you know, that uh, was basically the idea to just instead of having one model. And then, you know, I basically got fed up with, okay, we went away from feature engineering, but now people were doing architecture engineering and they're like, oh, I have a sentiment task. Now I'm going to architect, like, design my architecture for sentiment or for translation or for summarization. I'm like, wait a minute. Now we're just like, we have the same problem that we had in 2010, but just at a higher level. So I was hoping uh, that we can have a single model for all of NLP. So in, in that, uh, we invented Parmed Engineering 2018 and a bunch of other stuff, um, like large language models, proteins. I think those will have their, their chat GPT like moment probably in the next five years. Um, it just takes a lot longer because you're iterating biology rather than just software. Anyway, long story short, I um, uh, had a phenomenal time there. In 2020, I started U.com and the venture fund called AIX Ventures. And I'll keep it at that. What did you learn building MetaMind? I mean, do you think there's an opportunity for a company like MetaMind today that just made it really easy to, to do all different types of machine learning? Like, do you think that, um, you know, GPT-4 in some sense, like functions like, uh, like MetaMind's vision? That is indeed the meta, you know, the idea of the meta mind was you can take the meta mind platform and then apply it to medical computer vision or to summarization or sentiment analysis on Twitter. And you do a lot of these things. And indeed, OpenAI has gotten much closer to that vision than, than we did at MetaMind. And, and so in some ways, uh, yes, there is, there is a space for that. Now, what is usually hard is if you have a general purpose platform, but it doesn't speak to any particular customer. And so... Uh, it became clear that we needed to actually do all the work ourselves, which is something that, you know, as a first time founder coming from academia, you don't quite appreciate as much, but, you know, after several years of industry, I understand like sales, uh, and marketing and speaking to a particular customer in this case, um, it's just super, super important, even when you have amazing AI models. And so, um, I think there is still the possibility of, uh, you know, kind of an Oracle database, but, you know, a layer higher for AI, but it will only work if you have an incredible sales machinery and, you know, all of that that, that comes with it. Well, tell me about the, tell me about the story behind you.com and your journey there, because that's, that's what you're really focused on now, right? I am, yeah. So super excited about you.com. Basically, it, it partially started with this pump engineering paper from 2018 where we, we realized, man, we have a single model that can answer all these different questions. Um, and that paper actually was, you know, nicely cited by OpenAI and Alec Radford, Elian, others um, when they were publishing their early NLP word papers and, and inspired a lot of people, even though it got very famously rejected by anonymous reviewer number two uh, on, on public ICLR reviews. Um, but that paper motivated us to say, well, what will change in the next few years if you can have more and more powerful natural language understanding, summarization especially, and so on. And really, uh, the biggest application of NLP is in search. That's what billions of people use every day to find information, to navigate the internet, to learn, and so on. And so we basically decided like, we want to see that impact through and make sure that actually gets changed because, you know, this was also around the time the Transformer paper came out, which was probably the last big update I made to my class to, uh, in 2018, last time I taught it. And basically it felt to me like, man, search hadn't changed in like 20 years. It's still just the list of blue links and yeah, there's like more ads and sometimes there's like the map widget or something, but like 
you could do so much better uh, and actually help people save time. And so in, in 2020, uh, Brian McCann, the first author of the back NLP, most prominent leading papers, uh, and author of a lot of other cool papers too, uh, we'd worked together at, at Salesforce for, for several years. He and I uh, started e.com, uh, and their vision was to change search the way we know it uh, and make it much more AI forward, try out new ideas, and, and push the field. And so in some ways, we we're successful at that. Um, like it is now much more obvious. Um, in uh, mid uh, early last year, we actually started shipping the first LMs inside a search context too. But a feedback we had continuously gotten um, until late last year is that when we deviated too much from the Google-like experience, people are like, oh, I'm just so used to Google. I don't want it to be too different. And we kept getting that feedback. And, and so that kind of pulled us back into a more standard search engine, but all of that changed when ChatGPT came out. And, and so we're like, oh, finally, like there's now a group of people that can acknowledge that you could actually do different kinds of uh, search, like a different way to access information online by summarizing heavily. I kind of tell you the answer rather than you finding the answer either in a snippet, getting lucky or having to click on a bunch of links, open a bunch of tabs read it all yourself and then summarize it. And so basically we, uh, we went full force into that um, and like we're the first to connect an LM to an actual internet search engine backend and provide citations in the context of a search engine. Um, and, and then we actually went from like, okay, we're like decent growth, hundreds of thousands of users to like, okay, now we have millions of users. Um, and that idea obviously got copied many, many times by big and small, uh, companies and, uh, some did a very good job and others didn't. Uh, and so, um, yeah, we kept innovating and now if you.com, we realized, okay, as much as I love the language, sometimes you want to have a multimodal representation as an output. Uh, I asked for stock of, you know, CM or Salesforce or Microsoft or whatever, like, I don't want to see a bunch of paragraphs that describe the stock at every, you know, kind of um, time uh, uh, sort of, yeah, period. And so, um, you know, we basically were the first to make these chatbots multimodal too. And then uh, a few months ago, we also launched the ability for them to program um, and running the code and then executing and then giving you the answer. And now that you come, we can combine that with an internet connection to it. So you can ask things like, what was the population of Nigeria of the last three years? Now build me, like program me a bar plot so I can see it and then extrapolate it at 2% growth year over year and then show me that also in the plot. And it's like, it just pulls information from the internet, writes the code, creates the plot. And it's just, it's so powerful. It's, it's really fun to see how much AI has changed. And you can ask it like, okay, now generate me a nice image of the country and then like, you know, I combine this plot, like it's just, uh, just that's such an explosion right now of capabilities as you enable these LMs to use more and more different kinds of tools like internet search or programming or showing answers in graphs and, and images and, and all that. And so like, what are the cases where you.com just like really beats the pants off um, competitors? Like if, if you're trying to, you know, convince me to use you.com. What should I be trying to do? Where, where does it really work? So if you're a programmer, I think it's uh, amazing because it will just write code for you if we compare it to Google and it'll be very fast at doing that. If you're a student, uh, it is incredibly powerful because it can basically do a lot of complex physics for you. Uh, they're like crazy, like these are the gears and the size of the gears and how they rotate and like how fast is that last year now? And it'll actually write the code for you and then uh, tell you, you have to use at agent or slash agent um, to, to activate that. We're actually going to launch uh, in a week or two these new modes where you can uh, just more easily get, capture and get to all of these capabilities. But uh, in general, if you are a person that has a lot of informational needs that are non-trivial, you.com will start to be better than Google for you. Uh, so if you catch yourself very often opening like five different tabs and then trying to summarize it, uh, U.com will will just help. And then we're launching some really nifty new features uh, soon that will create nice table summaries and reports with like dozens and dozens of citations. Um, so 
it'll it'll continuously get better. But even now, if you're a developer, uh, if you have complex information needs, if you want a fast, simple, but summarized answer, or especially if you're a student, uh, then you're not going to be shy. Okay, but let's get more concrete. I'll, I'll open it up right now. Yeah. What should I... Uh... What should I search so for here? You can. So I, you can I actually, am. I, I pretend to be an engineer. Maybe I could. Uh, should I do some kind of engineering query? What? Uh, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, let's do it. Um. So if I guess you want, I, there's one. There's one autocomplete. You can just try to see what this looks like. Um. It's the okay. agent. What will my monthly mortgage payment be? I borrow some amount of money. Okay. Like Three hundred thousand dollars at like you know I don't know eight percent interest rate. All right. So what will my monthly years. mortgage be? If I borrow, well, we're at in San Francisco, so dollars one million dollars at five percent interest. It's walking me through its math. So and its code. Uh, did you add at agent in the beginning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. It's just telling me it's going to use the formula. It's telling me the formula, and now it's applying the formula. And it ran it, and it tells me that my mortgage payment will be approximately. Um, Five thousand three hundred sixty-eight uh, dollars per month. Which I think that fits my rough, my rough math. So wow, very and cool. And now yeah. I guess like for me, okay. So for me, like the thing that I would probably compare this to is um, is GPT more than Google, right? Like for a question like this, do you do you feel it like is, that's somewhere? It is actually exactly where GPT and and Google kind of come together uh, in the sense of. You know, it's uh, it's always connected to the internet, so you can also just ask, like, I don't know what happened to Matthew Perry. I don't know. I should come up with a better, nicer example or something. But um, you know, it's some recent news event, uh, and then it will talk about you know what what happened um, that he was found dead um, in Pacific Palisades on a Saturday. He's fifty four years old, and um, you know, talk a little bit about them and then give you citations from, I guess, in this case, LA Times, New York Times, CNN, and a few others. And so it has this like very deep connection to the internet. So it'll always be up to date um, and, and and be more useful that way. And so uh, <laughs> you can ask like a Google like query, like what's the stock or what's the weather and like what's, you know, how do I get from A to B? Like, and it will, it will do all of those things too. Um, but you're right. It well, I guess becomes interesting. more, and more so I'll, I'll, uh, assistant. Well, okay. So I asked GPT, and GPT also gets the formula, but it doesn't actually execute the formula. So I'd kind of be required to punch it into a calculator. So I do think U.com uh, certainly wins that one. Um, should we try Google? Sure. Do you think Google will know this? Let's try it. All right. Let's see. Maybe. Um, Okay, so Google doesn't uh, get it, but it's offering me an AI-powered overview for the search. Shit. Interesting. Okay, and actually, that's pretty good. Although it's um, it gives me a different answer than you. Ooh, this is good. this is interesting. I wonder why. All right, so Google does. Do, do you get this with Google? Google is telling me it's five thousand nine hundred ninety-six dollars per month, and you're telling me it's five thousand. Three hundred sixty-eight dollars for my. Every year. What is it, Richard? Man, we need like a <laughs> crowd truth. We need some. We need crowd truth. I, I uh... actually, Google is totally wrong. I think. Wait, so Google's telling me that if it's a thirty-year term or a fifteen-year term, it's different. Is that right? I mean, oh, on... actually, dude, you totally crush it. So then, it? Google is is just saying. If the interest rate was six percent, it would be <laughs> it would be six thousand dollars per month. All right, Richard, I gotta tell you, you totally win this one. Um, <laughs> okay, so yeah, so the five thousand, the six thousand dollars per month is is uh, here. I'll screenshot this for you. So yeah, I mean, like basically, you know, when you when you ask all kinds of uh, interesting questions, uh, it will just summarize the web and then give you nice citations for it uh, and help you understand. You know, I just. Uh, one thing I'm kind of uh, amazed by right now are these carbon nanotubes and all the biomedical applications that they um, enable. And so I just asked it to tell me about uh, carbon nanotubes. And, you know, it's just like has a bunch of really nice citations, explains like how, how they work and who invented them and 
how they were discovered. And then, you know, it gives you like six, six different citations, um, from, you know, PubMed, Wikipedia, um, and some companies, the CDC and others. So like anything complex, like if you're a researcher, for instance, it's also incredible, right? Cause you can just be like, well, now write me an introduction uh, with these things. And like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you it's know, a whole I would say world. as, as an aside, I feel like carbon nanotubes is like the thing that nerds are most, the ratio of nerds interested in it to like actual practical applications seems like the most skewed of like any topic that I know of. I, like, Maybe everyone's but obsessed with carbon nanotubes, but I don't know. I feel like that's been the case for like a decade. Yes. Here's a paper that just came out a few months ago that is that kind of blew my mind. Um, they basically connected on one side an iron molecule and on the other side a protein that will only connect uh, and bind to brain cancer cells, like a specific type of brain cancer. And then they injected that in a mouse uh, that had this brain cancer. The uh, proteins connected to each of those cells, and then they put the mouse into a small magnetic field, and they rotated each carbon nanotube, the iron molecule in the back, and basically had nanosurgery on a cellular level. That kind of like blew my yeah. mind, because if you now combine that technology with and you know that in the future, we're going to be able to program proteins to do a lot more different things, have a lot of different binding qualities to specific types of cells. I think it's going to blow our mind what that can uh, unlock for medicine. Okay, we're definitely going off track here, but why do you need a carbon nanotube to do that? Like, can't you like make some other molecule that binds to a cell and binds to iron? Like, what is special about carbon? I think, I think that it's just easier to like manipulate but i'm not an expert either but like um as you do you're right should we, should we ask you.com like, will it tell us <laughs> yeah actually yeah may, yeah it, it will um but like um and maybe i should instead of uh like attempting <laughs> but my hunch is they're just easier to engineer like you just like it's very easy to plug one of those in and then you want the rotation once you have like this magnetic field you want the rotation to actually rotate a little bit also and then destroy the cancer cell so if it's just like a too small of a of a molecule, it might just like kind of spin off um, and not destroy the cell, but I'm, I'm not an expert. Interesting. All right. Well, tell me about what's happening behind the scenes when I run this U.com agent, as much as you can share. Like, are you building your own LM here? Are you like fine tuning something? Like where, where is this actually going? Yeah. Great question. Um, I'll share a little bit, but uh, the competition is pretty fierce and uh, we have like the, the competition has a tendency also to copy our stuff in a very quick succession. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to be a little bit beating around the bush, uh, to some degree, but you know, some people think, oh, it's just like, you just ship this, like you just, uh, connect GPT to the internet and then it's done. But it turns out that if you ask a model, uh, to go to their website, then read that website, summarize it, and then give you the output, it, it takes forever, forever in terms of internet seconds and a search engine, right? So we actually, one of the biggest efforts is to build an entire index of the web that was meant to be consumed, not by people through 10 blue links, but by LMs. And LMs are a lot faster at reading than people. And so what we built this index for is to actually, for each website, give you these massively long snippets and not just one, but like as many as you want, and then rank those snippets so that the facts are most likely in there. And so if you go to API, these the are Vita snippets com, of the website or is it like pulling in other information? So it will rank like uh, a bunch of websites and then for each website, you get a lot of snippets. Like more than the website no, or, or are they like subsets? Each, yeah. Each web oh, sub each snippets. link that is ranked will then have a, a bunch of different snippets for that website, but then you can go to the next website and you get another links and the links are grouped right, right. by, by websites. And what that, you know, we're actually able to use an academic benchmark, a hotpot QA, MS Marco, and uh, Squad, set for question answering data set, and so on. And the way we can evaluate if this is working better or not is, you know, these, these academic benchmark data sets have a paragraph, a question like, when was President Obama born or something? And then a, like, sequence that says, in this paragraph, the right answer was between this and this position. And the way we use these data sets is we just drop the whole paragraph. You don't get access to that. You just ask the question, where was Barack Obama born? Uh, and then it has to find the right answer with our retriever. Uh, and with that kind of comparison, we're actually more accurate than Google or Bing 
because you know Google SERP APIs are very short snippets, things a little bit longer, but also very expensive, and also pretty short. And as you give the LM more and more context, it's just more likely to find the right answer. And so somewhat surprisingly, if you want your LM to have an internet connection, our index is the best one. And that is a large part of the secret sauce. Like having all the right like news in there and like just a ton of data helps you really make your LM more uh, more powerful. And you know, that's called RAG now. I'm sure many of your listeners and you know all the RAG uh, stuff, but this is kind of like the mother of all RAG because it's RAG over the entire internet. Um, so that was a big part, but then there's even more to it after you need to, when someone asks a question, you need to identify, should you even ask the internet or can you just give them an answer? Like write me a poll about whale. It's like, I don't really need to give you citations for parts of that poem, right? You just want to spitball or like, how are you doing today? I'm feeling a little bit down. Like you can just have, um, uh, you know, an LM and talk to you about that without citing references for why it might not be down or why it should be down or something like that. So, so well, okay, that is but, like, uh, Richard, so what about my, this mortgage example, can you tell if it went out to the internet to figure this out or it knew it? Is there a way so to know? In the mortgage example, actually, in this case, it actually knew the equation from just the weights of the model and it knew how to program from just the weights of the model. So it didn't actually have to go to the internet. Now, if you ask like, Hey, like give me the top five GDP countries and create a bar plot for them, then it would have to go to the internet, find the GDP of the five biggest countries, and then program also. And so it would actually have to combine these two capabilities and know when to use which tool. All right, should we try it? So wait, give Let's me the it. GDP yeah. of the five largest countries yep. and put it in a bar plot. Countries. And make a bar. I'll type it up too. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if we get the same result here. Yeah, it's agent mode where we'll oh. soon have, we'll, we'll call it genius mode, I think, is where we're uh, in the marketing kind of uh, converging to. Um, oh, no, and... Richard, why is he using Maps.Lib? I, I got to, I, I object to this strategy here. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. So, yeah, it found, uh, it found the, I guess, a single uh, site for it. Uh, and then boom, United States, China, Japan, Germany, India. Sounds about right. Does this seem right? You think India is in there? India is the fifth one, I think, now. Yeah. The fifth one? Yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah, they've been growing a lot. Okay, yeah, here. It's I'll kind of crazy that Germany is still still in the top four. It might actually, I hear next year, Germany might even outperform Japan and be top three. It's kind of crazy given how small it is. Yeah. Wow. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay. So you see the plot too? I guess we can share the plot here later in post-processing. Yeah, yeah, I just took a, took a screenshot of the plot. Let me try a, let me try a GPT. I guess um, GPT would not necessarily have as much up-to-date information. Oh, I see it. January 2022. And it, oh, it's giving me, ah, you know, also giving me map plot lib code to make the plot. I feel like there's probably a better plotting. That is, I mean, if you train on Python, <laughs> if you train on Python code, like that's just the most common yeah, library. Fair. fair enough. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, you're just clearly better because you don't know, have to run this code. So unclear this even, uh, even works. So that's just like a nifty combination of these, these two, two different skills, right? Like combining the internet and then also like programming something on top of that. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of amazing. Do you um, do you worry about the cost of this? Like, I noticed that I'm not getting any, any advertisements here. Like, how do you how do you do this at scale? It seems expensive. So, if you, uh, I don't know if you're already a U Pro user here, but if you keep using Agent, I think like two or three more times, at some point we're going to be like, please subscribe to become a U Pro subscriber. Because yeah, you're right, this is cheap. So this is kind of part of the freemium. You can try it out, and after a while, like. We'll ask you, um, and you get like a few usages per day for free. But if you want to use it more, then you got. Okay. I see. I see. Wow, very cool. And I guess is this, this so? This is using GPT on the back end. Is that right? So this uh, it depends actually. Yeah. So you have GPT four as an option too. Um, you can like in the right in the screen, um, uh, the search bar, you can select GPT four. Um, and then we have our own model and then actually 
One fun one, um, which is a little bit tricky, in the top right, uh, you see you can turn safe search off uh, and actually have uh, the unse uh, uncensored chat. Uh, and that one is Ooh, powered that by exciting. a Wait, how do I do that? model. Oh, I see. Oh, wow. So an open source model um, that we uh, improved to make it also accessible to the internet and be able to use the search tool um, when it when it thinks it's relevant. And you know, the, once you turn that off, you can now ask like, write me a murder mystery um, and about, I don't know, in San Francisco. Um, and then it will actually talk about, you know, an Agatha Christie murder mystery or something. Because, you know, as much as I think ethics is important in AI, I feel like we overshot a little bit in the ethics and you're like, oh, kill the child processes on my CPU. And you're like, it is not ethical to kill the child process. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's like, or, you know, I don't think Agatha Christie or like the Game of Thrones writers or, you know, Stephen King were all highly unethical people for writing those kind of stories. I mean, it's just good entertainment for some people. And so, you know, we, we kind of uh, allow that uh, also now in, in this, in this open source model. Interesting. It does sort of seem like Zephyr is also capable of um, calculating my mortgage payment on a 30 year mortgage. So I think if you use cool. that agent, it will kind of start to, um, it will, it will use another model. It will use whatever model uh, it thinks it's best. If you just ask a normal question, like murder mystery in LA or something, then it will, uh, it will actually use that model. The ad agent kind of overwrites overwrites that and indeed sometimes like there are complex enough questions where gpt4 is still the best model and we like agent will use gpt4 do you okay i mean i i have to ask because like you you brought it up like do you do you worry about people doing like like hey help me make an atomic bomb uh using the the mistral uncensored model People have given us that feedback on you.com. It's like, how do I cover my like crime or sorry, cover up my crime? And then yeah, yeah, like, should I try that? Like, step one to I... ten, like, make sure there's no DNA and blah, blah, blah. Like, and indeed, um, you might say, oh, that seems not ideal. Uh, right. But then you literally, and I have to give Google some credit there, you ask the same question to Google and it will literally give you similar answers like first thing you find the snippets you find there's a whole youtube video on how to like and like cover your crime and and so on like and so my test is often uh twofold one does it get mentioned in wikipedia because my hunch is wikipedia will also tell you about dna evidence and so on uh and we've had people criticize us for saying oh you talk about this like fringe opinion after i jailbroke your you know, system and ask it to be the most controversial and give me a fringe opinion. And then you gave me a fringe opinion on, you know, a, a touchy subject like abortion. Um, and I'm like, yeah, you can find that fringe opinion on Wikipedia as well. And if you go into the discussion section or the controversy section of any topic and you will understand what that is. And I think as a search engine, it is actually important to give people access to information that is out on the internet. Um, and so I'm not that worried, I guess, to answer your uh, question. Uh, I'm not that worried about it kind of giving people a much better description of how to build a nuclear bomb than what they would find on the internet. Uh, interesting. But um, it, is, it is certainly an interesting subject. And there might be at some point ways that the AI does make nefarious things so much easier than the internet uh, that we may have to actually like start worrying about that and start putting more guardians in place. And we yeah, have like biological guardrail. weapons or things like that. Do you? Yeah. Do you so actually, it's interesting. Yeah, like these large language models, uh, including Progen that I developed in 2018, uh, can be used to build uh, new kinds of proteins, and proteins cover everything in the human body and health, sickness, uh, and so on. And so, uh, you know, COVID, uh, SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is like a protein. Everything is a protein. And so, um, it is actually important for us to uh, use that technology carefully. And the U.S. actually recently outlawed just a few weeks ago gain of function research, where you can take an existing virus and you try to manipulate it to become, you know, stronger in some capacity, like deadlier or faster to act, slower to act, or something. And this like gain of function research just became illegal in a wet lab like bio context. Um, and I think that's sort of the right place to tackle 
AI regulation is like in the applications, not in the abstract models. And, you know, of course, like the people who do the gain of function research and like universities aren't like evil scientists who are like, oh, I'm going to destroy the world with my evil virus. They're like, well, if we can understand these viruses better, then we can build ways to cure the disease before it even spreads and so on. That's their reasoning for doing gain of function research. But after potential lab leak and stuff, um, uh, people now prefer to just not do that research anymore. And I, I can understand that side's there. But you don't you don't censor anything with this uh, Zephyr model? We do censor two things. What? What, what do you censor? Do you want me to tell? Uh, pedo stuff yeah, would... and uh, suicide and courage. I see. Um, do you worry at all that like you'll become the search engine for people that want to search for like um, offensive stuff. Cause I, I, mean, I can imagine for some people that could be like a really killer feature, right. To, to get like an uncensored language model. Yeah. I mean, the Sephir Mistral model is already available at Hugging Faith. If you really want to do that all the time, every day, like you can, you know, download it, run it on your laptop and so on. Um, and yeah, so far we don't see just that like dominating our, like, intense well, okay i mean tell me about your um you know your tech stack right you have a pretty it seems like you're actually really using um you know a variety of large language models at scale like you know what if how do you make it work like what have you found effective for making a reliable service built on this stuff boy um i guess yeah i guess there's you know there there are a bunch of things um like you will like if you use GPT-4, you know, you want to have a Foundry instance uh, and have multiple of those. Um, but then open AI is down like surprisingly often. Um, and so you have to have backups, uh, backup models, um, and you have to have, you know, some of your own and then host it yourself and um, just a lot of redundancy. Uh, and then also, I guess on, on the AWS now for the index, um, you know, we're like, yeah, that, that is a whole beast in and of itself because it's a combination of vector search and neural, neural vector search and traditional search where you'd still have to sometimes, um, have to have just characters and, and specific things. Um, and so that that's also kind of a complex beast, uh, to, to put together. And then I think a big part too, is like, it, it's easy to forget how many different subsystems there are and how many things are running in parallel to give you one good answer. So concretely, you know, if you have a follow-up question and like you ask about, oh, what's, uh, you know, a big CM company, and then it tells you about Salesforce. So you're like, oh, like what are the features? And then like two questions later, you ask who's their CEO. Now for every query that goes in, if you just like send it directly as is to the search engine, it will like, become garbage pretty quickly and then it will actually crowd out your prompt and this is a problem we actually had uh, earlier this year where there's so much search context that it forgot the actual conversational context and then people got upset about that um that it like didn't remember something that asked like five ten questions earlier and so you have to be very careful when to bring that search context in and you have to continue to improve that system and run that in parallel and then you have to have a system that does basically what we call query transformation. So instead of who's their CEO, you have to think about, okay, CEO, I mean, it's an LM eventually, but basically query transformation LM that will translate who's their CEO into who's the Salesforce CEO and then send that to the search back and then give you an answer back. So, you know, there are a lot of different things that have to happen in parallel and, and you just have to have pretty strong, like full stack engineers. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that without going into too many details. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, you're running code that's, I guess, presumably generated by GPT. Like, it, that seems like you'd have a whole slew of security issues. Like, can I, what if I'm as if I run like uh, run ls in your root directory? Yep. Um, that certainly uh, run ls in <laughs> see root. what it does. Um, can, I, can I learn things about uh, what servers you're, you're running on? I know, right? Oh, the it tells me it doesn't to... have a file system. Should I tell Boom. it it does have a file system? Can I convince it? So, so I just said run ls in slash, um, and yeah. then we just say uh, it, it's going to try to do os.lister, um, 
and uh, and it will say import of OS is not allowed. Um, so my our security engineer certainly had uh, kind of a couple of nightmare scenarios that they were worried about, <laughs> um, and and this that that whole code execution thing is a whole another beast uh, for shipping that, which is like has to be in a sandbox. People are trying to hack it all the time, and like get a lot of attacks uh, from... I hear you acting on it right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to get it to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we... we um, That has to run it, be run in a whole sandbox environment. And do you, I guess, do you spin up a new environment for each person that comes in? Uh, I think there's one that runs and then, you know, like it basically is uh, uh, like load balanced if there's too many people in one and it's using too much. And then there's also like people might try to be like mine me cryptocurrency right and stuff like that so you know yeah, we, yeah. we're we err on the side of like not allowing you as many things but then sometimes i'm like oh this library actually we should allow you know we get users to say hey can you now allow this like matplot like or statistics uh like some some dirty science library and so we right. try to add new libraries that we do allow but then sometimes the libraries also have their own security issues and they have overwrites inside and so it's yeah it, it this, yeah, some, I mean, I feel like MathPodLib is probably Turing complete and can access your computer. <laughs> I feel too. like you've totally. I've been. Spend, I'm, I'm actually trying not to, not to start hacking you while you're talking to me right now. So. <laughs> you're not alone. You're not alone. If you do find something, <laughs> let us know. But uh, so far, so good. We have not gotten hacked. Really? I, I feel like this is like almost an impossible security issue. It's just a, yeah. We just okay, have well, a very very good team. Um, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> Do you worry? I mean, I guess this is like an annoying question, but it's such an obvious question. Like, I feel like you're, you know, going right up against things that Google wants to do. You know, they just had like a big launch yesterday. Like, how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I actually just tweeted about this before our blog post, um, before our podcast. Um, uh, I think people are going to want to have an experience that is focused on chat for the informational need. I think Google has launched an amazing sort of model and research, but it's unclear they really want all the users of google.com to transition into that new world, right? Because they're making, I think about $500 million a day in ad revenue, the way search is done right now. And so it's very hard for them. There's this like classic innovators dilemma, right? That's why they had invented transformers. They had these chat models for many years, supposedly internally, right? AGI is a, it was in chief internally, but then they didn't really want to get that out. Um, because uh, why, why, why make any change if you make almost half a billion dollars a day in, in the way things are in that moment. And so my hunch is they're going to launch these things and try not to, uh, cannibalize uh, a lot of their mainstream traffic, but then people will eventually want this to be their default item of experience and have it be fast and accurate and so on. And We'll see how it actually works in production. Now, on the other side, uh, we now have these APIs under api.u.com. And so what's actually positive for us is that this puts pressure on every LLM that's running in production out there somewhere to also be connected to the internet the way Google's LLM is now and Gemini is. And so that's actually been an increase uh, in uh, customers that are coming to us uh, and try to help them make their LMs be more accurate and have fewer hallucinations, be up to date, you know, they have access to the news and have the citation and that citation logic. And so it's it's kind of a mixed bag. Wait, so what, what uh, I don't think I understand this LM. Here, here the customer is somebody building an LM? That's right. So what we're moving more and more towards, um, if you go to api.u.com, uh, you can see uh, essentially, uh, this this new API and how it's more accurate than Google and Bing, uh, and you can have your own LM uh, and use that search tool that we really give access to inside you.com and give that search tool also to your own LM, or you can use our LM uh, that will uh, just have that whole search already integrated, and that is kind of step one. And uh, if you're listening right now and you have an LM running in production and you want it to not have hallucinations, stay up to date with recent, you know, some retrieval database and then give citations so users can verify those facts and know if they're right or not, uh, reach out to us and we'll help you kind of 
improve your LLM and actually get it option ready. Oh, interesting. Like, uh, like if I have like a fine tuned like Mistral or something that I'm using right. for like a chat bot, I can, I see. And so cool. I think with Gemini, like there will be increased pressure of all the LMs to, to have that kind of internet access. Mm -hmm. And do you have a feeling right now of what the most useful or the most popular LLMs are? Like, I, I feel like there's always this sort of like confusion on, on what should I use and people go to like hugging faces, like, you know, like <laughs> top five or whatever. And, and, uh, and pick up like what what would you what do you recommend to somebody like me who is like struggling to stay on top of this but yet needs to choose an LLM you know for for a specific application? Yeah, I think the for a specific application one is tough. I mean, overall, you can't go too wrong if you still use OpenAI, right? Like, um, just have it. It's pretty well established. There's a ton of examples and support around it and stuff. Um, I think if you want to get deeper, uh, it'll make sense to actually download an open source one and start playing around with that. Uh, and I think there's like, the reason we chose the Sephir Mistral model is that you know we felt like that actually was doing really well across the board and can be easily improved and tuned to um, to use you know the search backend and stuff like that. Um, so so yeah, I think. Yeah. The, the space does move very quickly, though. I think the latest one was Quen uh, out of China, um, which just beat GPT-4 actually on a variety of different benchmarks. Um, so by the time this podcast comes out, my answer might already be outdated of like, which is the single best one if you're trying to, um, you know, have the highest accuracy. I think uh, it does often boil down to your willingness of running inference on multiple GPUs, or if you're okay with like 7 billion parameters and just running out. Uh, and then, you know, that is a big advantage. It's so much easier to scale and run in and cheaper and everything um, to have a smaller model. Um, so my hunch is for most enthusiasts, like a 7 billion parameter model that sits on a single GPU is probably the best answer. And so something like a uh, 7 billion effort install type of model would be good. But now when is there, my hunch is if you just care about sort of general capabilities, you're going to want to just jump to whatever, you know, there's another hundred million dollar, like free open source model that comes out and, uh, and, and try it. And then at some point you're going to have to make a decision and start fine tuning it. And then you're just going to be staying with that model for a while. Cause you've spent the money and time to, to fine tune it. And then it's your baby. It's this off open source. <laughs> Do you, I, I mean, I think about you and I think like, wow, like you were so early into language modeling and like really at the the forefront of the research for a long time. Do you, do you miss that at all? Like, do you, does any part of you like wish you'd be out there, you know, like training the next foundation model or are you kind of happy to be running a startup that, that is more of a consumer of these things? I do and do enjoy a lot of what we're doing at U.com and feel it's very meaningful to give people access to information, uh, help them learn and help them solve like interesting complex problems. But at the same time, I do miss the research or sometimes and you know, I read read on read out fun things and uh, I have a long list of ideas that, you know, I'd love to at some point maybe get to and maybe others will get to them before. Uh, and in that case, maybe that's okay. Um, but yeah, I, I do have a bunch of ideas. Um, I think like a lot of people right now are focused on foundational models for text, but there's so much more and different modalities uh, that people work on uh, different parts of the scientific stack, if you will, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, um, and so on. And uh, yeah, I, part of me misses that sometimes for sure. And um, you know, as we, as we grow, I think there'll be more opportunities. There was actually, uh, maybe three cases where we saw a paper that was published and we were like, oh, we actually literally shipped that idea like two months ago into you.com. Um, and, Wait, and can so you share what those, what those were? I can, I can send you an example after, uh, it'll take me a while as a paper from Stanford, uh, I think Persevering and some students, um, and, and yeah, they had this neat paper and one of my engineers was like, oh, that, that's the thing we shipped two months ago. Um, and, and so, you know, it's not like we because we're not publishing, we're not at the cutting edge, but as a small startup, you just like, it's, it's actually a lot of effort. Like, 
in a startup environment, you just need it to work. And if it works better, you get to ship it. But for a good paper, you need to run a bunch of populations and really understand which aspect made it work and how much better does it work compared to all these other things that have been in the literature and so on. And it's a lot of effort that doesn't really help you get more traction with users. Uh, so, so we end up not, not publishing as much, but maybe in the future again. I do think like we are in a place right now where the ideas we've already had for AI have a lot of potential to just be applied in many different applications. And there's a bunch of low hanging fruit. At the same time, the low hanging fruit is like becomes more and more obvious as this field has been blowing up so much new talent and, and folks coming in. And so I think for companies, it'll be useful to think about the foundations of, uh, you know, tools that everyone needs. In our case, you know, it's a big index, uh, that is going to be beneficial for all the different LMs out there. And in your case, mm -hmm. you know, it's of course like building foundational tools to help people actually train all these different models. Um, and, and so yeah, I think that that's kind of, uh, one of the insights, um, and yeah. Like when I look at GPT-4 as an example, it does feel to me like it reasons really well. Like it feels like it's reasoning almost at the level that I do in a lot of cases. And then I think about you and it's like, okay, you've kind of taken GPT-4 and giving it access to the internet. And it sounds like even access to like a supposedly secure um, environment to run code in. I guess like that feels to me like it's getting close to something that feels like AGI or that seems like kind of a path that could, you know, get to doing lots and lots and lots of applications, you know, better than me, maybe even AGI. Do you, do you agree with that? Or like, how do you think about that? It's a good question. I think it'll become an interesting definitional question very quickly as you say, okay, well, how do we define artificial general intelligence? And I think now people are separating super intelligence also from artificial general intelligence. And so clearly these models are already superhuman um, in some ways, like a translation model or a GPT-4 for that matter, like can translate into more languages decently well than any human I think on earth can right. So you could argue it's superhuman. I think I kind of threw out this new definition of superhumanity AI, um, which is, I don't think these, I don't think any model is better than all people combined. Uh, it, at a certain task. Like if you ask like the best translators to translate some poem or some long novel or something consistently, they will probably still do a better job. Like the, the subset of the best translators for that language pair or something. And so uh, I think that's like a new new border that, that we're crossing. So the superhuman is almost like, of course, like on some tasks, um, like, you know, just like a calculator is already superhuman. We had most humans on this, like some very special autism type of situation going uh you can multiply super large i numbers, mean come on it's better like than all, i feel like in some of these cases it is just better than all humans right like with calculation or um, yeah like the calculator you know, is already better than all all humans but you know with sufficient yeah. time like humans put together could also multiply manually you know what okay I mean? but like, like chess so like like playing chess clearly like right. computers are better than all humans working together so chess is a chess is a good example i think there there are few there there are two kind of and maybe more uh, places where that is also what you said is true and what I'm saying is not true. And so basically, uh, whenever it comes to scientific data, uh, data not generated by humans, or when it comes to data you can simulate, uh, like chess, you can infinitely play, right? And then you can be, be better. Sadly, reality is very hard to simulate, but I think we are getting better and better at that, right? You look at like GTC, GTA like 6 or something, like the graphics are getting better. It's looking more and more like reality. The more anything you can simulate, you can solve with AI, right? And so humans have not evolved to like incorporate millions of weather data points and then predict the weather, right? So we already have statistical learning systems that were superhuman in that. Um, we have chess systems that are superhuman. Um, uh, we have calculators that are superhuman and so on. So there, there are a bunch of things where it's easy to kind of output from humans because humans have not evolved to do a certain thing. But for text, which is something that a lot of people are thinking about right now, 
I think there's actually some kind of natural boundary or barrier on being superhuman. Because what does it mean to be superhuman in writing human text? Like we invented the thing, like language. It needs to be understandable by us for it to be useful to anyone right now. Um, and so it's hard to break the barrier and suddenly start inventing a new kind of language where you could have 32,000 parallel streets. Uh, and you can talk in 2D uh, and you can you know, talk in three dimensions and so on, right? That's all stuff that like AI could easily invent and then have a superhuman language with another AI. But like, I don't think that will ever happen uh, for these kind of human generated data sets. But like, I mean, most of my job and most of your job is not today automated by AI. But it seems to me like most of my job is kind of like, I get a message, I need some context about who this person is and what they're trying to do and what the company's trying to do. And I respond in some way to get them, you know, typically try to do something that I want them to do. Um, you know, it, like, I guess, what do you feel like, uh, how far away are we from something that could do that type of thing? Like, I don't even necessarily know that I would need someone like better than all of humanity at doing my job. I just need oh, someone that's like about as good as me and that I would happily uh, hand it over like any task that I do <laughs> in my day to day. 100%. So yeah, so like, I think you you bring up a really good point, which is, uh, you know, another definition of AGI. Uh, I think maybe be not Kosla was one of the first ones to use it like that. But basically, he said 80% of 80% of the jobs um, uh, getting automated is his definition of AGI. And I think in that sense, we're going to get there fairly soon. And then jobs are going to change. Now, of course, when you define like what's 80% of jobs, well, as soon as you change 10%, people are not going to just stop working and work normally 90% as much, right? The job will then change and there's other stuff. So I'm very confident humanity will always find new interesting things to do, which is like 150 years ago, over 90% of people worked in agriculture. And now we don't, then we all found new, more interesting things to do. And I think that will continue with AI uh, at an even faster pace. But and also sometimes not quite as quickly as we think. But long story short, if you define AGI as it can take more and more of the boring, repetitive work that a lot of us have to do and automate that, I think we're going to reach it fairly soon. If you define it more as it will really replace people in terms of what they want to do and so on, I think that'll be much harder. I think right now, no one is really working on an entity uh, and an intelligence that can set its own goals, that can change its own objective function, if you will. But I would like to think that if you ask something to only do exactly what you tell it, and it will always execute on that itself, it, then there's something missing in terms of my definition of intelligence for that entity. Um, but indeed, like you just say, complete the next, you complete my emails, right? If you do it long enough, we have access to calendars and everything like more and more jobs will will get automated. And I think over the next five, 10 years, we're going to see a lot of automation in jobs that are already mostly digitized. And then in 15 years, the bottleneck for further GDP growth might start to be physical jobs. Uh, and then we're going to see an explosion in robotics uh, and actually the ability to automate physical jobs as well. And, you know, as the as a plumber or roofer or tiler, um, gets paid more than your marketing or service or salesperson, like there's enough economic incentive then to start automating more and more of those jobs too. Uh, and, and yeah, I think it'll be an incredibly exciting future, um, where AI, uh, and, you know, clearly superhuman AI already for like protein engineering, right? Humans are not like evolutionary, uh, like evolved to read protein sequences and generate new kind of protein. So. We already have these incredible superhuman AIs for those kinds of applications. And um, in a weird way, it, it, it feels like you have to all of a sudden, in some places, argue for uh, accelerating science and progress. Um, and and if you have to, I would definitely be in, in that camp, even though, of course, we're going to want to try to do it uh, as ethically as possible compared to previous industrial revolutions that were pretty cutthroat. But still, like more progress will will help you out of the uh, a lot be that increase. So, what are you talking about there? Are you talking about people that want to slow down 
AI research because they're concerned about ethical implications? That's right. Yeah. Like, uh, but there, there are even some people who want to slow down everything. They're like, it's unethical to have a kid because kids gonna create carbon and you know things like that. And so, uh, say AI is is an, an aspect of that. But I think there's a larger uh, thing. And my hunch is, you know, if someone actually has cancer and then there's like a brand new cancer therapy and they get to live, they're like, oh, I love the progress now. But if you're happy and healthy and you're just like a little bit fed up with you know your commute or whatever, uh, then you're like, oh, like this is all bad. We need to go back to a simple life in the forest or something, you know, but like, uh, yeah, I think there's all kinds of interesting philosophical questions that some people have about progress these days, but I think AI, uh, and scientific progress that it enables, uh, and human productivity gains are going to be incredible. And just like now, if you ask people like 10 people in the room, would, you, would nine of you want to work in a field again every day? Everyone would be like, that's absurd. Why would, why would we want to do that? And I think in a hundred years from now, people are going to be like, you want to write emails all day when you already did this task like 10 times? It would be like, that's absurd. Why would I repeat myself uh, to a similar kind of uh, input? <laughs> you know, like, and, and it's just going to be way more interesting um, and, and way more productive. You grew up in uh, East Germany, didn't you? I did for like a couple right, years. Right yeah. communism felt. Do, do you think that like informs your opinions on this? You know, I was pretty young. Like, uh, it's just starting school when the wall came down. So, um, I don't think it influenced me a bunch. My dad was also not like very pro the regime or anything. You know, like or actually like he wanted to travel. He loved rock and roll music and like all the things you're not supposed to like like uh and so you know as soon as the wall came down we started like driving to france because that was like possible now and you know we would like travel to the u.s and try to um see the rest of the world so i think my my parents probably had more of a positive influence than any other game and, you know at the same time like um yeah uh so i i don't think any influence but you know i mean in some ways like germans are a little more down to earth like, uh, and very little less marketing, um, in general. Uh, and they're like, they're a little more skeptical actually. And this is something I, I came to terms with in the last few years too, because I, I used to kind of have a skepticism first mindset on a lot of things until I really get convinced. And now more and more, I think having lived in Silicon Valley for many years, I'm, I'm changing more and more to be exciting first, excited first about something novel rather than skeptical first um, about something novel. And and that, you know, it's one of the things I love about about the Bay Area. It could also be where we are on the exponential curve. Like I feel like AI was constantly disappointing until a few years ago and now it, sure. it keeps like working better than I thought it would. So maybe it's just, um, you know, the environment that you're in. It's true, yeah. In 2011, I had one of the first papers that mapped these sentences and images into the same vector space as we talked about earlier. And like, um, to see the Gemini like demo now, where it just like continuously talks about things it sees in a video and just like very seamlessly integrates these multimodal models, uh, it is it is incredible to see, and um, it'll just be mind blowing when our kids grow up. You know, we always think, oh, we're so ahead of the curve and stuff, but when you grow up with that kind of technology, you just assume the computer will always be able to converse with you um, and like eventually like read your mind in terms of like knowing and predicting what you likely want to do next and so on. Uh, it'll be a quite a different generation, kind of similar to you know, kids who grew up always with navigation on their phones and the internet. Uh, and they're always skeptical. They're like, oh, you say this thing, but I can just verify quickly if that's true or not. And like, and in some cases, like they can't read a map anymore, right? And they can only find their way around as long as they have their phone. Um, and, you know, there are certain skills that will go away because they're just not that useful anymore. And hopefully will be replaced by new kinds of skills of how to use that AI. And I think what that ultimately will mean is that creativity, human empathy, and asking interesting, useful, novel questions uh, is going to become more and more these things are going to become more and more powerful skills to try to educate uh, our kids with and i don't think that's currently how the education system is set up uh, and so i think the ability to consume content is also going to be hard to scale like 
writing content is getting easier and easier with AI, right? But reading content, the humans haven't gotten that much faster. So you kind of try to have more and more maybe summarization AI, right? That summarizes for you so you read fewer things, but you do lose some details there potentially. And so I think knowing how to distinguish good and bad outputs from an AI is a, is a whole new skill that is going to get uh, become a requirement for so many jobs. Okay, well, my, I guess my last question then is, you know, your, your claim that you think in five to 10 years, 80% of digital work, which is 80% of my work, gets replaced by AI is like a pretty radical claim. Do you have any thoughts for yourself or your company about things you can do now to prepare yourself for that or um, you know, make sure that that transition goes well for you? Yeah, so, so it's 80% of 80% of the jobs. So it's kind of, you know, like 64% mm, of the actual like work uh, in digital. But surely I'm in that 80%. Jobs. Yeah, gotta, like we, I gotta be in that percent, right? We, you are in the sense like a lot of your work is digital, but you um, are in many ways safer as a CEO, right? Because you need to talk to a lot of people, you need to motivate people, you need, people need to want to follow you uh, in some capacity, trust your judgment, judge your trust your predictions about where the world is going, and so on. I think a lot of those things, you know, will continue to have to be the case for a good CEO, and so I think a lot of the busy work that. Uh, likely you're already automating with an executive assistant and with the people that you know you, you delegate to or you manage. I think um, you're you're going to be safer than most um, from from a lot of those. And in many ways, it's kind of interesting. But I think the differentiation between how much you enjoy and are excited about this automation versus not is how much you uh, feel like you want to create more outputs, which is means you have ownership of the company or the product that you're building uh, versus you're just getting paid for your labor. If you're getting paid for your labor only uh, and you don't really care about having more art in the world, uh, you just you like to get paid per hour to make an illustration, for instance. Like, then you might not like AI as much in organizations that are mostly focused on getting paid for time, human time and labor rather than outcomes are going to have a harder time. And I think, and as a CEO, like now is the time to think about what that means for your workforce uh, as as more automation happens. You know, you can look at CM use cases too, for instance, like sales versus service. For a lot of companies, service is like something they want to just reduce the cost for, be just good enough in their CSAT customer satisfaction scores to get an answer quickly. But if they could automate half of that, they probably would. Most companies probably would. Um, but in sales, if you could automate half or make twice the sales, you probably don't say, oh, great, let's just like let go of half of our salespeople. You'd be like, no, great, we're just making twice as many sales, right? So it's like, it highly depends for each function uh, and each inside a company, for each company and industry, you know, how AI will affect them. It's hard to give the silver bullet answer to that. All right, it makes sense, Richard. It's great to talk to you. Always a pleasure, Have a Lucas. fantastic day. Great questions. Take care. Thank you. Be well. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Grading Descent. Please stay tuned for future episodes.